That's where the continuity broke me. That's where it lost me. <laughs> that, no, that's where it lost you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Cinema Decon, deconstructing and overthinking the movies of our younger years. My name is Steve, and on this podcast, we will revisit the movies that we keep in the back part of our minds as flawless masterpieces, untouchable by any criticism, and hopefully they stay that way. Join us as we rewatch a randomly selected movie from our list of 300 plus from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. With me on this journey is my co-host, Aaron whom you can still find dialed up to Prodigy every night on his 28.8 KBPS modem. How are you tonight, Aaron? I'm hanging in there, Steve. This week has been kind of a pain in the ass, even with the holiday weekend. Thankfully, I was able to carve out some time here and there to, for a classic movie such as the one we're about to discuss. So what we do here at CinemaDecon is a rewatch of an old movie with the hopes that they're still as good or as bad as we remember them. Then Steve and I meet up to talk about it, point out our high and low parts, and then give it a rank and place it on our mega list. So before we get into this week's movie, I wanted to bring up an idea that we had today, which is creating a Cinema Decon Hall of Fame. Oh. <laughs> the idea behind this would be, is after we review a movie, we pick someone from the cast or crew of that entire movie who we want to put on our Wall of Fame. Wall of Fame, Hall of Fame, same thing. Can be director, could be an actor, actress, writer, key grip, whomever. What is a key grip? I have no idea. <laughs> Rent that down. <laughs> we need to get a guest on here who actually knows movies. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I say we just continue with complete ignorance. <laughs> it's been working for me all these years. Do you want to go through the first four movies real quick and see who we can put on the Wall of Fame? Yeah, I'm good for that. Should be pretty easy. I would think so. Uh, starting with number one, Coneheads. Uh, I think we were both, uh, I have a feeling we're both in agreement on that one as the uh, wonderful, talented Mr. David Dan Spade. Aykroyd. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Dan Aykroyd. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> little column A, little column B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dan's a pretty easy, easy target on that one. It was, it was his movie, and he's going to be a Cinema Decon regular as we move forward. I'm assuming you're writing these down because I'm not. It's all up here. <laughs> oh, then we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and the show has reached a new low. Uh, what about Independence Day? For Independence Day... The, the two main thoughts are, are Will Smith or Jeff Goldblum. And my personal pick of the two, and maybe this is just the geek in me, is Jeff Goldblum. And I was actually leaning a little towards Randy Quaid. <laughs> You're just trying to appease Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. He might hear you. God. <laughs> um, but between the two, if I were to go between the two of Randy Quaid and Jeff Goldblum, I would, I would lean toward your side just – and, and it, between Jeff Goldblum and Will Smith, it's kind of a hard, uh, hard sell because those two together were perfect. True, but yeah, um, I'll I'll agree with you on the Jeff Goldblum. Uh, maybe it's also the nerd in me. I one day too hope to aspire to crash an alien system using my power book. Jeff Goldblum is, will also be a regular on on many cinema decon films. Yeah. Next up would be the Wedding Singer. What would your nominees be for that one? Aside from the obvious of Adam Sandler and my obvious of Christine Taylor, <laughs> shut up. Uh, uh, on that one, I would. <laughs> I would my, my vice favorite, Adam Sandler. My, I mean, yeah, yeah, my favorite character out of that movie was uh, John Lovitz. That's a good one, actually. John, just John Lovitz's character on that. And I mean, do we have any other movies on the list that are Adam Sandler? Oh, yeah. Happy Gilmore's on there. Happy Gilmore, Little Nicky. So he's got plenty of, obviously, plenty of chances. Oh, John Loves is a good one, though, for his one great scene. It's like, it's like, uh, <laughs> yes. it's like Judy Dench winning the Oscar for eight seconds of screen time. <laughs> I mean, it's, 
to me, I don't know. Are we going for pretty much literally our favorite actors in this, in each scene, or are we going for our, like the favorite characters type thing? It's, Character it's really whatever your view is of the movie. I mean, you could even say, uh, uh, Oh, Steve Buscemi. No, I can't think of her name. another one. Um, Drew Barrymore. Prin- Princess Leia. Carrie Fisher. Yeah, Carrie Fisher for being the script doctor that pumped up Julia's uh, oh, storyline. I mean, that's correct. I forgot uh, about that again. Yeah, I mean, there's so it's whatever you view the the movie as far as who, who you think should be. Well, we have we have a couple thing. Star Wars we have a couple Star Wars movies on here. I'm sure Carrie Fisher will win one of those. My my vote is still oh, no. I, I no. I kind of like John Lovitz. I right. I, I do. I, I I you won me over on that one. Peer pressure, yum. <laughs> and then <laughs> what on American Summer? Dear God, <laughs> uh, what on American Summer for me would probably be Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd. It's, he's really the only one you can <laughs> Just, pull out of there. It's that's it's to me an easy one. <laughs> some ama- as amazing things as he's done, that is probably his best bit of acting, playing a sixteen-year-old spoiled brat. I agree. It's going to get a little harder with this week's movie, though. I don't know. I kind of have a feel on. I, I've been I've been pondering it ever since we came up with the idea. I kind of have a feel on mine, but we'll we'll get to that later. Today's movie is the 1995 thriller Hackers, directed by Ian Softley, starring Johnny Lee Miller, Angelina Jolie, Matthew Lillard and Oscar winner Fisher Stevens. He didn't win an Oscar for this film, though. Ah, skateboarding hitting me skills alone. He should have, but yeah. So Aaron, what do you remember of hackers? I remember that it was a completely accurate depiction of the information technology industry. That's a lie. I remember it (laughs) as being completely (laughs) hacky and, but still entertaining. Um, It was very funny. Uh, It came out when, uh, I was obviously too young to be working in the industry, but I was still interested in it. I was a, I was, you know, one of those computer nerds in middle school. Uh, I can't remember the exact year that it came out. What do we have? Do you know what year it came out? 93, I think. Uh, so I was a, fr- yeah. So it came out in 93. I was a freshman in high school. Um, I had been a seasoned computer nerd for quite some time. Uh, I remember watching it and, and enjoying it quite a lot, even though I knew even at that point that it was very hacky and campy and it obviously took some liberties, uh, particularly with the uh, amazing Gibson computers uh, that were the main <laughs> phrase that, in that aspect. But I did enjoy a lot of the, the play on uh, just random uh, acronyms that uh, the main character spun off. It was also funny because later in life, uh, the story behind it that I recall is the main character was a prolific child hacker named Zero Cool. uh, (laughs) Oh, yeah. Zero Cool. You uh, you laugh, but I remember the shit. Uh, He was his nickname was Zero Cool and he was arrested as a child and not allowed uh, for being a hacker and then not allowed to touch a computer until he was 18. And funny enough. Post high school, I worked with a company back in Kansas where, and I'm, I won't call out names or anything, but one of the main executives at this company had kind of a similar backstory where he was arrested as a teenager with a similar type, you know, zero cool sounding name for similar activities. I don't know if he was put through the same rigmarole as Mr. Zero Cool was, but it was, it was kind of the same backstory where he ended up being hired uh, as a CIO or CTO type person of this company because of his past at being this hacker when he was a teenager and being caught by the FBI. So that, that was kind of cool. When The first time I heard about that, uh, the immediate thing I thought of was, holy crap, it's a real life zero cool or crash override. Yes, I remember it. So I hope you're ready for this. I don't have any memory of ever seeing this movie. Oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> it's this, I will tell you, this is an absolute documentary of how life in the IT industry is. I know you're a little removed from that being in your manager chair for all these years, but <laughs> this will bring back some memories 
uh, all your AWOL drives and the BLT systems, um, TCI, SP, whatever's. I do know it has Angelina Jolie and Johnny Lee Miller. Uh, yes. Johnny Lee Miller, who, who I, I know from the elementary TV show. Ah, yes. But as a network engineer, uh, I, I, I am ashamed to admit that I, I just, maybe I've seen it. Uh, but when I think of it, I think of, of Bye sneakers. and shame. Oh, my God. I mean, that and, one and I, I know. That one I really want to watch. But yeah, but I, 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 I should have seen Hackers just based on my profession and, you really should and experience. But I, I just have zero recollection of ever seeing between, it. Between Hackers, Sneakers, and The Net. You have to watch. Oh, the net I've seen, three. but I, I, the net I have seen, but zero recollection absolute, of how again you know, the net terrible is an absolute was. documentary and is completely real to life, as we all know, <laughs> just like hackers. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to watching hackers oh, finally uh, in in committing this to memory. <laughs> oh, crash and burn, baby. That's all. That's <laughs> one of the biggest things. And and freaking uh, what was it? Uh, Matthew Lillard as oh, is he uh, in serial. It? Matthew Lillard is in there, a serial killer. One of the great, one of the great uh, online screen names. That was a great time. Yeah, this was back in ninety. No, Hackers was ninety five, so I would have been a sophomore or junior. A quick Google though yeah. tells me that uh, it does star Oscar winner Fisher Stevens, who oh yes, who we know lovingly as the, as the you know. Oh. Side sidekick in short circuit. So. <laughs> yeah, a, a role that he could not play these days. No, and he he has gone on public saying he regrets he regrets the brown face he did in short circuit. Which I understand, but it is sad because he was very good at it. Uh, it also has Lorraine Bracco from Sopranos fame. Oh, good and, and good fellows. Yeah. All right. Well, we will go off now and watch Hackers. All right. Pack the planet. There's a new virus in the database. What's happening? It's replicating, eating up memory. Uh, what do I do? Type cookie, you idiot. I'll head him off at the pass. We have a zero bug attacking all login and overlay files. Run antivirus. Give me a systems display. Die, dickweeds. And we're back. We have watched Hackers in all its <laughs> glory. Glory. We will likely have differing opinions on this film. <laughs> you have the nostalgia factor. I do not. Fair enough. And I think that that is a big factor in this movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is one of those movies that i jokingly whenever an, anybody asks what it was like being a computer nerd in high school or what it's like getting into the it industry there are a couple things i direct them to this movie is one of them just <laughs> just as so you joke. just flat out lie <laughs> oh and well <laughs> you say that but there are quite a few truth they obviously Hollywood up a lot in this movie, a lot of, a lot of the technical aspects of it. So they obviously Hollywood up a lot of these technical aspects as they do in a lot of movies, because if you were to keep a, all these technical nerdy computer type things at hundred percent truth, you'd lose a lot of people and more than likely it's going to be boring because let's face it. We're not all actually like super cyber cyber sleuths. 100% of the time, maybe only about 30. And that's pushing it. I think that might've been true for the mid nineties. I think that if this movie was made today with the same exact plot, it could be done so much better if they really cut out the goofy, you know, made up hackerness. If that's a word. Hacker, hackitude. <laughs> the hackitude. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright 2021. I mean, there's there's a there's really a great story in there, you know. It's it's got a firm three act structure, and it's uh, there's there's solid story arcs. There's there's it's all there, but they add in so much stupid shit that it loses me. Exactly, it really does. There, there's I was gonna say yeah. If you if you take away a lot of the uh, silliness and campy styles that they go for portraying the your typical you know hippie 
computer hacker. The plot and uh, backstories in here are actually quite good. I uh, I actually enjoyed the plot a little more because, it, like I said, it's been years since I've seen this. And I actually paid attention a little more to the plot this time and got a little more out of it. And I'll agree with you. If they were to make this movie today, they could probably do it a lot better. It seems like uh, it seems like the thresholds for writing this kind of stuff has gotten up because so many people have realized this is just all campy and not true. And even the even the hacking nonsense as far as the the GUIs and the uh, uh, the, the screenshots that they take as far as the awesomely powerful power books, power books everywhere. Oh, yes. Uh, it's what lost me on this movie is the villain, the plague. <laughs> Eugene, <laughs> and, and and we'll get to that as we as we. Well, here, here go ahead and, and give a, a plot summary for our listeners. So, let's see. Spoilers for a 1995 movie. <laughs> spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! A group of high school seniors. I'm assuming they're seniors. Yeah, a group of high school seniors uh, get blamed by a big te- big company security officer for uh in a superman 3 style theft escapade i don't know <laughs> that's the first thing i can get off the top of my head yeah pr- pretty much i did like the intro the the pre-act stuff where you got it starts off with the trial and even before that the the really creepy intro of the fbi so it, it comes off in this really creepy camera like fuzzy camera intro to the FBI closing in on our main character's house back when he is 11 years old. Oh yeah. The SWAT team. And there's no, yeah. And there's no information about it this time. You just know a a SWAT team or an FBI team is basically raiding this kid's house. And then it jumps into the trial. Slowly pans over the, the, the prosecution desk and then get the defendant desk as the, the judges talk or no, as, as a young Felicity Huffman is talking. (laughs) Oh, yes. The prosecuting attorney was a, a very young Felicity Huffman, you know, pre-Oscar and pre-felony criminal record for her. Yeah, this was definitely like pre-Sorgan era, I think. Before her three months in jail for the college tuition scandal. Attica. <laughs> but then it, it, it slowly pans over, and at, right as the judge is sentencing 11-year-old Dade, Dade Murphy, uh, so you realize that this whole, this whole intro is about a kid. And he gets sentenced to, I believe it's uh, seven years. Seven years he, can't, he can't use a phone. Uh, can't use a phone. Can't use a computer. He can't. Use, well, he can't use a touchstone phone. Touchstone he, phone. He can use rotary yeah. dial. <laughs> Go nineties because those still existed in nineteen ninety five. Millennials <laughs> and their family gets, gets charged uh, forty five thousand dollars, which in nineteen ninety eight was about a hundred grand today. So pretty significant. Okay. But then it jumps to uh, what, would be, what would be present day in the movie, so 1995. And uh, I did love the transition from an aerial view of New York City to a circuit board. Yes. And the, that the power was pretty, running through it. That was, that was nice. That was pretty cool. Yeah, a little, nice little fade in of a cityscape built onto a circuit board. I did see a big skyscraper, though, with Pan Am on it. <laughs> so I had to look it up. And, and that's actually wrong pan am was discontinued by by 95 so it was was like like three years prior so i'm wondering if they that's how long it was in production it could be like 92 made that intro in like 92 93 or they or they were optimistic that it was going to come up but then it gets into a nice scene of the basics of social fishing yeah, good old social engineering. Which I, I I say I enjoyed this this whole scene. Yeah, the the social engineering where he calls the security guard and just bullshits As his Mr. way Eddie into Vetter. Mr. Eddie Vetter, <laughs> and he starts like say the the BLT file when yeah, AWOL. his BLT drive has gone AWOL, and he has a project due in the morning for Mr. Kawasaki, uh, and basically he's social engineering his way into finding out the mo- the modem phone number. That's all. He, that's all he's finding out. Which for anyone listening to this, that is basic social engineering. You get a call like yes. that and they're fishing for information and it happens daily today. So don't be yeah. an idiot when that, people call you. I was going to say that por- that portion of it is 100% real accurate. Whether or not anybody is going to – any security guard is going to be fooled by Mr. Eddie Vetter is up for debate. Yeah, he should have been lost at Kawasaki. 
So you know those Japanese engineering te- techniques or those Japanese management <laughs> techniques. Oh yeah. Did, did he have to wear sunglasses the whole time in his dark little bedroom? I mean, were those really necessary? He, he's no longer zero cool. <laughs> I don't know. I think he's zero cool until he gets caught by somebody and then realizes he can't say he's zero cool anymore. So he has to make something up. So in the meanwhile, what he's doing is getting this, getting this modem phone number and happens to be a TV station. He's watching this really crappy like TV show of just a complete douchebag on a talk show. And he, he decides uh, while he's dialed up to the station to basically connect into the VHS control system that controls what's on the air automatically and change the tape. So he can start watching the, an episode of the outer limits. Yeah. Then, uh, then there's another hacker also dialed in that decides to challenge him to a hacker fight. Basically. Yeah. He's, he's treading in on this hacker, this other hackers turf acid burn. So then they start getting into a hack off for lack of a better term to where they're basically keyboard warring each other to try to, to try to win the control of the uh, VHS control system. Yeah. That was my first red flag of what this movie was going to be. That it was, it was the, the hacker fight. Like, Oh, okay. I, I know what I'm in for now. Cause then that goes right into the uh, high school and uh, rollerblades, lots of rollerblades. Oh yeah. Everybody rollerbladed in the streets of New York city back in the nineties. So, so in 95, I, I was a sophomore in the computers and, you know, just like everybody else of that nature. And I can honestly say that New York City's New York City high school in the nineties was nothing like rural Illinois in the nineties. Same here. Yeah. If any of that was remotely true. Even in the biggest city in the wonderful state of Kansas, nothing like that. And I would have never rollerbladed <laughs> rollerbladed to school. As as Dade, who is now known as Crash Override online, as he's walking through the hall, he has no idea where to go. Uh, why he asks a guy on the phone for directions, I don't know. But the, the guy turns out to be part of his crew. But he ends up in, in the in the main admin office, office. where he meets yeah. where he meets Angelina Jolie, uh, whose yeah. name was Kate. Kate Libby. Kate Libby. Yeah, Angelina Jolie, full on in Ferengi, not Ferengi. <laughs> Angelina Jolie in full on Romulan slash Vulcan. Uh, hairdo she looked exactly like a next generation romulan Mm -hmm. and it's not just the hair her clothes at some points in the movie i mean they were all romulan-esque oh god don't don't get me started on the clothes that was another weird ass trope in this movie that all the hackers (laughs) dressed as pretty much as absurd as possible which i mean the 80s were when we dressed absurd. We left that stuff in the 90s. It was all about the grunge era at that point. I'm not entirely sure if anyone actually dressed like this in the mid-90s or if it was all just on TV and movies because I never saw any of it in person. Granted, it wasn't in New York City. Who knows? Same in my little town. Yeah, it was not, not, none of that. Uh, I did enjoy the uh, pool joke on the new guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, the uh, olympic size swimming pool on the roof. That happens to be a locked door where all the nerds get caught. And then it starts raining. But how many new guys do they have that day? Yeah. There, there was like a dozen kids out there. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a bit. Well, he, then he does some hacking internal on the computers and he, he gets into yeah, he her class. Uh, goes into in the computer class. He and, hacks into the student system, changes his class. So he's in the same class as her while the kid that he asked for directions on the phone earlier, which turns out to be Ramon, AKA freak is turn is basically turn around and watching him do it. And that's when freak basically realizes, okay, he's, Mm -hmm. he's one of us kind of thing. And he makes a joke that wouldn't fly today because he freak asks him, uh, what's your interest in Kate Libby? And his reply is homicidal. Mm. That's not a joke that would (laughs) be written today. Like physical, sexual, emotional, homicidal. But w- along with Freak is where we also meet Joey. He was having a severe identity crisis of the online persona. Yeah, he, he desperately wants to be one of the cool hacker kids. If, if you know, cool hacker was a thing. It is a thing. <laughs> 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 uh, 
don't disparage my people. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's trying really hard. He becomes important later. This entire the entire plot of this movie, spoiler alert, is all Joey's fault. Yes. But for the better and the worse. It's you can also fault. say it's his group's fault for not teaching him properly. We're assuming they were teaching him at all. Um, True. A lot of a lot of that. I, it seems a lot of that culture. It seems like is you. You're only respected if you figure it out yourself. If I have to teach you, then all you know is what I, the same thing I know, kind of thing. That's what I. That's what I got from it. Yeah, he, he knows. He knows enough yourself. to break into an oil company on his own. Yeah. from home. I mean, he's not. He knows more than what he let. He knows more than what he lets on. He's just new. He, so he, he's got he's talent and untrained talent can be dangerous mm. uh, so they now that they know that Dade is a uh, you know elite hacker in their eyes at least in Freak's eyes they invite him to their I, I, what is this place they go to it's like a empty pool thing with big video games I'm not sure where exactly they go yeah it's some kind of underground party slash uh, arcade party or something which of course we run into uh, Kate aka we don't know her as a hacker yet. Uh, we just will. We, we, sh- we see that she's a gamer. Yes. Well, but before we, before we meet Kate, though, we meet a uh, serial killer. Ah, Manuel Goldstein. Yeah. Outside AKA of Matthew Lillard. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of this party place, uh, Matthew Lillard is uh, giving out mixtapes, <laughs> uh, mixtapes with singers who choked on their own vomit. So. Oh yeah. Hendrix, Joplin, Mama Cass. Mm-hmm. All artists fixated <laughs> on their own vomit. Yeah, Matthew Lillard was uh, a pleasure in this movie. I, I will give you that. Yeah, his his jokes and his his acting. I mean, he's great. I, I like Matthew. He does really. uh, about the only thing about him that I would say is pretty much most of the movies he's ever in. He always put, he's always the same character because like serial killer seems to be the same guy as his character in Scream, aside from the obvious tropes the same this uh the same shaggy that he played in the uh live action scooby movie but i mean it obviously works for him the few things that i've seen him where he doesn't play that specific type character it almost doesn't it almost doesn't look right he blew my mind in the twin peaks season three i have still not finished that his acting in that is just wow not something i was i was expecting this type of character when i first saw him on screen it's like Okay, this guy's gonna be the comic relief. No, it, it, it is. I, I don't know what David Lynch did to get that sort of emotion out of him, but is it was it blew my mind. So hmm. he was one of the highlights of that crazy season three. But yeah, so back into the party. That's where they all have a little sit down at a table. Serial killer, freak, crash override, and Joey, uh, where they start throwing around some widely known. You know, IBM and Unix manuals show their street cred. Which uh, all those all those books are absolutely real. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. Yeah, uh, serial killer is pulling out these manuals. What, by the way, serial is spelled C E R E A L. So as so as in yeah. like breakfast cereal. Cereal as in as in Count Chocula. And Freak uh, was aptly named P H R E A K, which is an old school term for basically uh, hacking phone hacking. Uh, phone, public phone systems, which, uh, they which show he him demonstrates doing. early on in the movie yeah. of, yeah, basically uh, recording the sound of coins being dumped into a phone. And he basically has a Walkman with the tones recorded on it that he plays into the speaker and basically tricks the system into giving him a free call. Yes, this is exactly what you did to get free calls back before all pretty much all calls are free. So, Queue up next day or that night, probably. You've got Joey. He was trying to tell the guys earlier about how he get he can get into these Gibson computers, and they didn't really believe him or take him serious. So he's trying really hard to to get something on disc, yeah, to prove that to he, prove, he prove can himself, do it. kind of thing. Because he was telling them about how he hacked a hacked a bank system, uh, or he hacked a system. wasn't sure what it was. Which, in all honesty, back in the day, that was. Uh, in the days of dial-up, that was relatively normal to where you do a war, you do basically a war dialer system to get a bunch of active modems. And then you'd start 
connecting to him, prowling around to see if you can figure out what it was. So it wasn't out of the normal for him to be to start working on a system without actually knowing what type of system it was. So that's how he gets into it and uh, realizes it's a bank. And that's when they all just kick his ass for it because he has now uh, hacked into a bank system uh, in another state. I think it was like Seattle or something uh, across state lines, which, of course, is a big FBI issue. Is it that table reading there where they they talk about the four passwords, four most common passwords? Yes. Uh, Like sex, love. Uh, Money. money I I always thought it was God, sex, love, and password. Uh, They don't say password. That's not the four. I know. That's not the four they gave, but that's that's what I learned. Yeah. Was password was one of the most common passwords back in the day. Yeah. Um, But the the password in question here is, is God. Yeah. God would never be up this late. <laughs> so yeah, Joey that night hacks into this uh, random uh, available modem through Gibson and whatever, and uh, uses the God password. He gets in, and this is another red flag for me where we start seeing the the super evil data center and the animations for hacking. Yeah, the the three D representation of this giant Gibson system which in reality is all text-based what he's seeing or what he should be seeing. But no, it's, he's in a virtual full 3D environment. Yeah, and he, he finds a garbage file, which seems significant, garbage file where you, you know, dump stuff that you, know, you would think that is gonna, going to be garbage, but often not. And he starts copying it to a wonderful three and a half floppy disk. Over the sub 28.8K BPS modem, we know he was connected slower than that because they all freaked out when Kate's new laptop later has a 28.8 modem. <laughs> so he's on a 14.4 maybe, yep. 95. 95, yeah, the uh, 28.8 just recently came out, I want to say. Maybe that's why Acid Burn won that hacker fight. <laughs> yeah, blame it on the hardware. So soon we find out that Kate is, is acid burn. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoilers there. Of course, everybody knows by this point, but in the middle of this wonderful hack, it say it cuts to the actual data center and you've got a random security guard played by Penn Gillette sitting in the middle, <laughs> watching screens. <laughs> it's just so absurd. Of course, which is exactly <laughs> what every data center looks like that I've ever worked in. Uh, it's so ridiculous. With the, it, they even have the, they have the physical, they even had the physical glass towers behind them, as if the physical representation of the virtual Gibson. Well, and you, the and you had, and you had electricity, you know, bolts yeah, going, going everywhere. up the towers and, like, and everything. It, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it yeah, was so people, absurd. People getting it, into the IT industry because of this film were doomed to be so disappointed. But, but this is where we meet Oscar winner Fisher Stevens, who skateboards into the data center in a very stoic, dramatic way. In a giant mink coat. <laughs> with the wonderful line of, never fear, I is here. <laughs> <laughs> He's got this huge mink coat, whereas Penn Jillette is wearing literally like a henchman, all blue jumpsuit. He looks like a henchman from Dr. No. I love that Penn Jillette, though, he didn't even really want to be there. <laughs> the way he <laughs> delivered his lines and the way he acted was just it was very like I need a, I need this. I, I don't know if he was supposed to be that or if he he just really didn't care. I think we're being hacked. <laughs> what should we do? Yeah, <laughs> it's like uh, two days to my retirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're being hacked. What do I do? <laughs> but Fisher Stevens is where I started to just. I, I did not like the character. He is ridiculous. And he is in a different movie than everybody else. Everybody else is, is taking things serious, but he's doing such absurd things throughout the entire movie that he wasn't a villain. It was, I don't know, did not like that character. He was just dumb. He was, he was half comic relief, half inept yeah. villain that was smarter than everybody else, or at least he thought was smaller than it. he assumed he was smarter than everybody else. He could have been a normal, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, sinister executive with the know-how of like, why tell he makes everyone call him the plague. 
And yeah, which is your first even when you're in a, he's in a room with the, the executives the next day. And he actually tells like the president of the company next to him, don't call me Eugene, call me the plague. That was- <laughs> Nobody does that. You know, if he had a secret alter ego as the plague as a side thing in this movie, and you don't know it's him because his executive persona is normal, completely different movie and much better. Agreed. Uh, and the, one of the funnier lines was at, when he first comes up, you know, uh, on his skateboard, Penn Jillette's like, Mr. Belford, what do we do? It looks like we're being happed. And he's like, don't, uh, I told you to call me the plague. And he goes, oh, Mr. The Plague, what do we do? We're being hacked. <laughs> and Fisher kind of looks at him for a second and then decides, not, not worth it. <laughs> he just sits down. But, but even one of the executives do that later. You know, Mr. The Plague, it, what, what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> but due to this inciting incident of Joey uh, hacking this, they are able to get the Secret Service involved, and uh, who's run yeah. by a young Wendell Pierce. It was nice to see him. Yeah, I always enjoy Wendell Pierce. So what? Yeah, the whole the whole thing on that is they start they start tracing him back, and then as Joey's still downloading the file in mid download, his mom comes in, tells him, "Nope, it's bedtime." She walks over and just shuts off the power to his computer. A, don't ever do that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not 95. Definitely no. Oh, no. No, that, 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 that shit's all corrupted now. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Apparently, he was downloading it directly to his floppy drive because he didn't have to copy. He wasn't downloading it to the hard drive and then copying it over. Maybe he didn't have enough room for that. He didn't have enough room for that 1.5 meg. That giant 1.44. <laughs> yeah. So he, he basically gets cut off before they're able to find out how much of the file he he has, but they were at least able to trace the phone. Now, this is all a very cautionary tale for any IT people out there against super users and ransomware. Super users can be a very bad thing. You know, God passwords and ransomware is mm-hmm. a very real thing, as we all saw with the, the real life oil pipeline late recently. So exactly the types of viruses in this movie, you know, many of them are actual viruses mm-hmm. glorified with you know, graphics and, but the, the theory behind what they're doing is real. And yeah. And even the whole Da Vinci thing was a play on a real virus. Mm-hmm. Uh, by this time, the plague, Mr. The plague gets the secret service involved. Uh, they raid uh, just Joey's house. Thankfully, Joey was a little smart. And when he pull, uh, when he uh, realized his download was done, he pulled the, uh, floppy drive out of his computer and basically hit it in, in an overhead air vent inside a uh, marble, uh, Marlboro, Marlboro. Carton of cigarettes. Carton of cigarettes. Yes. Marlboro. So then the next morning, yeah, Joey gets, uh, Joey's in the middle of taking a shower with a Walkman on, like a full corded <laughs> Walkman hanging over the shower. He's, yeah, he's got like Ziploc bags over the ends of the Walkman and... Uh, the earbuds parts, and yeah. <laughs> the, str- the struggle was real, man. <laughs> to which, as soon as he pulls back the shower curtain, a la Psycho style, there's th- there's the Secret Service, fully <laughs> guns drawn, which that's another thing they did. is I think they they seriously came out guns blazing on all these hackers, which is not something they would actually do. They would be standing there with a clipboard. They would have weapons, but they wouldn't be full drawn on these no. kids. no. No, they would, say, they would be more like a Chris Hansen moment. Uh, why don't you could sit over here? <laughs> did you did you notice the power glove during the interrogation scenes? No, I missed it. Ah, uh. yeah. When when you've got Wendell Pierce and Mister the Plague uh, talking about how <laughs> they're going to let him go and tail him, you got him in the background, you know, trying to pick up his, his pieces of his computer. But then you got a, I think it might have been Mark Anthony, the Secret Service agent, you know, pull, putting on the power glove and like. Just looking at it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Power glove. That just makes me want to do wizard next. Uh, but but you do have a scene in the Ellison Mineral uh, executive room where Mr. The Plague is briefing his corporate board about what happened. It's, it's where we meet Lorraine Bracco, who's an executive on this board, who I will say looks looks very weird as a young blonde. It's not what I was used to for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, She's Henry Hill's wife in Goodfellas, which most people know her from, or from The Sopranos as the therapist. But yeah, she, but she still has that Jersey accent, which is very weird. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing her on screen and, that and way. The 80, and still has the 80s hair at that point. 
It's a decade with the going. shoulder pads. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, but then, as they're leaving that executive meeting, we find out that Lorraine Bracco and Mister the Plague are in cahoots, and the Da Vinci Code, Da Vinci Code, <laughs> the Da Vinci Virus, <laughs> is uh, is actually a cover for their more more sinister plan, which is they're doing the Superman three style. Uh, slicing the you know couple pennies here and there, putting it into their own account, their own offshore account. Yeah. So the da Vin- the Da Vinci virus was a a failsafe, so that if they got caught, that got triggered, so that they could blame whomever is a patsy hacker, and their scheme goes unnoticed, which is kind of a brilliant plan on on the surface. Exactly. It was kind of a smoke screen. So this and the Vin- the whole concept behind the Da Vinci virus was modeled after a, a mid late nineties real virus called the Michelangelo virus, which was a real thing. It didn't do the same thing. It was more of just infecting and, and disabling computer systems in general, uh, primarily Windows based systems. But uh, that's where this is where the the inspiration for the naming convention and the and the full on graphic of the Vitruvian Man. Yeah, I gave her a nice graphic. Speaking, like in a deep fake. Um, and the, the Da Vinci virus was designed as a ransomware that if you, they didn't do something, they would capsize several tankers out in the ocean. Which apparently this entire company's uh, yeah tanker fleet had absolutely no manual overrides, which I think is also something that would never happen. They say also a cautionary tale. Don't rely too much on, on the technology side. You, know, you got to learn from Admiral Adama. You know, keep it off the network some, sometimes. So basically what he's what he's doing is he's he's using this Da Vinci virus to basically frame Joey saying that it was planted by him when all he was doing was getting this garbage file. The garbage file which apparently has all the code and the money data for this worm that he, this original worm that he wrote to steal all the money. Like 25 million dollars I want to say. 25 million, yeah. Yeah. Which again, good plot. Yeah, it is. It is it is it, an excellent Excellent sinister plot in the background. Next up is the main group back at school the next day where they start talking about how Joey got arrested. They assume it's because of the ATM machine and, and they quickly mm-hmm. turn towards, by the way, there's a party tonight. Yeah. <laughs> hey, our friend, her friend got busted by the FBI and he's now grounded under probation, but let's go to a party. Poor Joey. He, well, originally he didn't want to go, but then they said it was at Kate's house. <laughs> yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. So it, it took a lot of arm twisting for him. Which at this party, yeah, I went to my fair share of, of parties in high school, and no, no, they're they're this not like tra- this. This is a straight up like trance party. It's a it, it's a teen movie style party where you know there's a DJ in the corner and everyone's actually dancing and which of like, course yes, and then yeah, and by this time we've we've now met Lord Nikon. Oh yeah, we forgot about Nikon, named after his favorite photography system. Who happens to be the DJ? Well, wait, do they, they, yeah, they go, they meet him before the party or when do they meet him? Yeah. Yes. That was before the party. Okay. Because he was the it, DJ at, it's the at party. It's at his little apartment where they watch the uh, Razor the Burn. Razor and Blade. Razor and Blade. Apparently there's a, like a UHF style public access TV show for a couple hackers that do hacking tips and tricks. Uh, they look like total posers to date. This who's the first time hearing about it. So he kind of writes them off as just being, you know, cele- fake celebrities. Hack, Hack the, the planet. planet! And then they also go into, they actually explain the the whole freaking concept that Freak was using earlier. But yeah, it's at Angelina Jolie's party, house party, where they uh, they start ogling her new laptop. Yeah. And that's Angelina Jolie. She's got a nice house. Her mom is a is an aunt, author. published author, like best uh, best selling like self help books for women. Yeah, it sounds like a man bashing book series. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they all bre- they basically break into her room or just sneak into her room to Google her new laptop with an amazing twenty eight point eight BPS modem, which again is technically wrong. Which she just lets them play on her laptop i was kind of surprised that i mean at this point she hasn't noticed them yet when she bursts in with uh well yeah she's making out with her her boyfriend boyfriend. uh but but even after uh once once the boyfriend's like you're not getting into all this computer stuff now are you you know and that's your first clue that and she kind of shoots him she's she's a computer nerd too Uh, but then in this scene we find out she's acid burn 
But then let's say then later on, like a few minutes later, she's letting Dave just type on her computer and she says things exactly. like, you know, I, I hope you don't type like you screw. So they, they start their um, flirting. Yeah, I hope you don't screw like you type kind of thing. So they're kind of kind of flirting, but not really. I enjoyed Johnny Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie in this movie. You know, say when, mm-hmm. when I said that Fisher Stevens is in a different movie, these guys were playing their parts well. They were they were fun to watch. The whole the whole crew really. Uh, mm-hmm. They all uh, stereotypes, sure, but they all uh, worked well together. Even Joey, who was supposed to be the annoying sixteen year old, he played the annoying sixteen year old well. Yes, agreed. And then serial killer, basically just Matthew Lillard being Matthew Lillard, always having to crash at other people's houses. Yeah, then and they never explain his backstory. Yeah, or no, hey, can I crash at your place again? Sure, but they're all they're all well, good with it. But then well, they yeah, also they don't exp- him. They also don't really go into within this dancing house party. You've got Mark Anthony undercover as a Secret Service agent. They just show him solo dancing in the middle of the room. I want to say this is where they realize who date is no no not yet he's still just crash override who is an elite hacker they don't know he's no 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 no. no. this is where the secret service and the fbi realize dave murphy is part of this crew because this oh, is yeah that's okay after the party it cuts it to is after the party the plague yeah it cuts to the plague playing this vr melee combat <laughs> game in his garage <laughs> which was very high tech at the time and that was a real thing and then agent dick comes in and gives them the information that Dade Murphy, a.k.a. Zero Cool, is part of their crew. So they basically go hassle him and try to recruit him. To, uh, they know he knows Joey. They know he's in the click. They basically say, uh, help us get this information back or help us get this disc back. We know he has it uh, or I'll ruin your parole. For Jamal out there, if he's listening, Agent Dick will always be known as Bunk. And for those, if you got to watch The Wire, if you haven't yet, but Wendell Pierce is always going to be bunk to me. Mm-hmm. Is that, and then next is, is where they go and they, they uh, accost Dade in his room. Yes, this is where he meets Mr. The Plague. Yes. <laughs> Who, again, he's in a different movie. He's, he's smashing up his stereo. He's, he's going all crazy. And the, yeah, he starts smashing things with a baseball bat. Secret Service just lets all this happen. Yeah, that's and that would not fly. If Agent Dick Bunk was in on it, I could see him giving the plague some mm-hmm. leeway, but they never let into any of that if he was in on this whole no. thing. Uh, but yeah, they just let they just let this random guy harass a high schooler. And I'm thinking maybe it was done this way to make you think that he's in on it. It could be. I mean, they they obviously have an outside the office friendship, but I mean they don't they don't typically say it yeah and i think that whole thing is basically uh plague helps dick catch you know young hackers which makes dick more popular and gets dick tv interviews yeah it it, it makes it lets him move up the ranks yeah so now now dade has an internal crisis he can uh he, he's been outed as far as to the authorities who he who he was zero cool And Mm -hmm. he has an offer. He can pretty much turn on his friends and turn over that disc, or he could not do anything at all. Not help. And then the play is basically said he'd make his life a living hell uh, or cook up something to violate his probation. So, so now Dade has his internal crisis. He's got new group of friends. He's got a love interest and he's got the corporate espionage people that are pressing down on him. Uh, So, what does any high schooler do in that that dilemma? You dream about Angelina Jolie's boobs. Naturally. Yeah. And then immediately getting arrested afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. You combine them all in one dream. <laughs> <laughs> and then right after this whole thing happens, that's when they Well, that's when they start their little hacker challenge. That's where they start the little bet, yes. Yeah, they they have a bet. Belongs in the group. Um, so this, this honestly, this was the funniest part of the movie to me was there. Yeah. This, this part was good. Fight, And it wasn't so much a fight. It was basically who can hack the best hackathon. Uh, and they decided to make the bet uh, around hacking agent Dick and messing with who his harass life, him the best. Which is yeah. Exactly. Who can, who can mess with him the best? 
the stakes were that where, where did I get? Um, if Kate wins, Dade has to be his slave. And he looks at her and she's like, not like that, dumbass. You basically do all my grunt work, uh, get me coffee, shit like that. Uh, and if Dade wins, Kate has to wear a dress on their first date. <laughs> to where we, we then jump into <laughs> the semi-montage of them getting ready. Dade's practicing quick draw on three and a half inch floppies in the mirror <laughs> a la taxi driver. <laughs> you that talking was, to me? <laughs> that was so dumb. <laughs> Multicolored floppy discs. Yeah, because no nobody's <laughs> ever done that. Like he's oh, got it, oh, it, it yeah. stuck, sticking in yellow, his belt, red, blue. quick draw. <laughs> nobody's ever done that before. Yeah, they, they give uh, they 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 give Major Dick a a, a record like a couple DUIs and stuff. So it shows him getting arrested on the hood of his car. Yeah, they go they go through and they max out their max out or cancels credit cards. So as he's out to dinner with, I'm assuming as a wife or a girlfriend, the waiter comes back and cuts his card in half. Which is that an actual thing? I've never seen that anybody. Just yeah, it's just a dramatic movie trope. You see it all the time. I was gonna say they can't do that. No. As a as a young soldier, my card was declined many times. So yeah, they don't cut it. I think that was Dade doing the credit card hack, to which uh, Kate returned by signing him up for a ton of personal ads. Yeah. Uh, at that time, uh, so basically, he was getting phone calls, a lot of phone calls to his work phone, which, like an idiot, he was answering on speaker. <laughs> some of them <laughs> in his desk while people are walking around, and he's personally answering all of them. Yeah, the the next one they did on him was they gave him the false warrants for arrest. So I got him pulled over and he's sitting there like, you know who I am? You know who I am? Kind of thing. And then finally, uh, Dade sets his medical records as deceased. Oh, that's right. That was the final one. So they, that was good. So the, the crew decided <laughs> that it was a draw up until then because he's dead. What can, else can they do? This is when they're, they're about to set the next round of stakes, which is uh, whoever loses... Uh, has to wear the dress, including Dade. When uh... now, this, this is when this this is when the plague comes back and threatens the mob. The plague, the plague FedExes him a laptop that <laughs> that just has a video file on him uh, of basically how he's threatening him to help him, or he's going to issue warrants for his mother's arrest in like Washington State. And then sick the FBI on him. And then when after she's arrested, uh, he's going to go in and delete the records so that she gets lost in the system, which, again, kind of a sinister thing to do. Oh, and, yeah. And a real yeah. life issue that could p- possibly happen. Yeah, because Joey, yeah, Joey got out and gave the disc to take, told the disc to Freak and Freak, uh, to which Freak, after he gets picked up, uh, again, Freak's a jailhouse phone in a very real way yeah, to be able to call a number other than the one they gave him and tell Kate that it was in that place where he put that thing that one time, mm-hmm. which happens to be behind a condom machine. Uh, <laughs> they go to, they go to Dade to ask him to help. He declines because, and he finally tells them why he finally tells them that he's zero cool and he can't yep. do it. Or, uh, cause I think that's was part of his probation is if he's ever found, if, if he ever does anything like this again, He's going away for even longer, and, but he at least agrees to create a copy. So he makes a copy of it, and that's the one, as you said, in, in the weirdest fucking scene. It, yeah, the weirdest scene in the he whole. He waits movie. out on a. You got you got Dade out there at an abandoned street corner in the middle of the night, and a limo starts pulling up, and on the back side of the limo, you've got Oscar winner Fisher Stevens on a skateboard on a, being pulled Marty McFly yes. style. <laughs> And then he side of it. He he he, he, he rides a skateboard past Dade, grabs the floppy disk, and then goes up to the next curb, and then gets into the limo and drives away. It that was so odd. Did, <laughs> did he know. actually get in the limo, or did he, he just does. stay sketching on the back of it? Okay. No, he gets into the limo. I mean, all he had to do was just ride the limo, grab the disk, and then keep going. I mean, there, there was no need for the skateboard at all. I I don't understand it. Again, it's just pushing that whole trope of all all hackers are hippie, hippie skateboarder, trance type well, people. I, don't I mean, know. it reminds me of Steve Buscemi meme with you know, you know, how you doing, kids? 
Yeah. How you doing, fellow fellow hackers? <laughs> He's just trying too hard. I, I, I don't mm. know. I don't understand the skateboard thing. It was completely out of place. So unbeknownst to the plague, this is a copy that he gave him. So 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 the the whole team, the whole team is able to take the actual file, figure out what the plague is actually doing, and they see they see the money, they see the ticking clock within the code that within a short time these tankers are mm-hmm. actually going to capsize and cause a major environmental situation. So they're they're running out of options, and all they can really do is hack the Gibson. And I and I was wrong before. This is the scene where he. Uh, tells them all that he was zero cool. It wasn't. It wasn't before when he reflected it because Nikon's there, and Nikon was like, "You're zero cool, man. I thought you was black." <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Which it was damn. It was damn funny. Which is funny. So yeah, they decide now since they don't have a complete file, they can't prove it. They decide they have to hack the same Gibson, find that same garbage file, and get the full thing so they can have it as proof. Uh, explain their hacking plan at the end. <laughs> See if you can. <laughs> so there was, yeah. So there's a couple things they need. There's a couple things they needed. They did in here. They, uh, Kate and Dade were scouring garbage, uh, for printouts and information in order to get, in order to make like security badges for their corporate office, as well as information on what type of uniforms they have, things like that. Uh, to which a security guard comes out, tells them to scram and Kate, fires a fucking flare gun straight well, at that's him. That's right. <laughs> like that's 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 gangster right there. <laughs> Cyril and Nikon steal a steal a utility uh systems manual or diagramming manual from a road crew while they're out there. And as they get caught, the guys just scream, Gar <laughs> and make the guy jump back down. That was pretty funny. Yeah, that was good. But Nikon also goes undercover inside the building to uh, cause he, cause he's got the photographic memory. So, so he's, he's looking for passwords and he almost gets, and he walks right by the plague too, but the plague doesn't know him. Yeah. Yet. And at that point, that's, uh, about the time the 10 30 that morning or so plague launches the Da Vinci virus to basically start filling up the tankers. He launches it. So it'll go off at 10 30 the next morning, uh, in an order to try and get these ha- this hacker group off the streets. So he's, he's using that, hey, they launched it. You need to go pick them up now kind of thing. Yep. Uh, unbeknownst to him, serial killer uh, planted a phone tap uh, under his receptionist uh, desk uh, very oddly as she was still sitting at the desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they know that warrants are coming out for like 9 a.m. in the morning. Dade and Kate then go to find the real razor and blade at this, again, techno nightclub thing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they they go. They have to go recruit Razor and Blade as yeah. part of their hacking they need, team. They need more help. Yep. Because of the out of the four of them, they're they're not going to be able to do what they need to in time without mm-hmm. other people, without having more people to uh, basically use up all the resources yep. and run interference. Which is eventually, uh, you know, what they basically need. It's kind of a DDoS. Type. Yeah, in, in a sense. Yeah. But of course, Dave thinks these guys are just phonies who are. Uh, using hacking to get famous and everything, but it turns out they really are, you know, elite hackers uh, and they, and they are on, in, on the back end while, every, while the rest of the thing is going up, they're recruiting uh, all their friends and known hackers from around the world, which is the, uh, the scene where they finally come in is the first time you see a, uh, a hacker that doesn't fit the hippie trope is the, like the French businessman who's sitting out drinking tea. Did you catch who that was at all? I don't, it's, it's a hard, well, it's uh. No, but the first going by memory, the first thing that comes to mind is John Hurt. It's actually David Stewart of the Eurythmics in a cameo. Oh, the non Annie Lennox part of that duo. Nice little cameo. Interesting. So then they is this where the traffic light hack comes in? Yeah. So that yeah, they all they all exit and converge going to Grand Central Station right around nine a.m. Uh, they know they've got tails on them, and that's when uh, they hit the the hack for all the traffic lights basically turn all the traffic lights green to cause all the cars to wreck while they're in rollerblades. And maybe this is the the adult in me. Yeah. How many people died during that traffic light hack? That was reckless and dangerous. And yeah, and maybe it's me being old. That one was dangerous. Yeah. That's you being old. 
Everything else has been targeted to the people involved. That one, innocent people probably got hurt. I don't know. I always, I always got the sense that, and again, I've never been in New York City, but I always got the sense that because there's so much traffic in New York, nobody ever drives that fast. So anything like that is just all real slow, you know, real slow hits that just piss people off. Yeah, but you got a lot of pedestrians. And and that's how they depicted it in the movie. Uh, This is where we get even more power books, power books everywhere. Yes. Uh, They all commence on Grand Central Station to a a bank of uh, pay phones. Of pay phones. And uh, Dade puts something weird over his eye, which I don't understand the point of. But what was that? Yeah, it was like it, it was like his X-wing targeting targeting <laughs> computer dropping down over his right eye. Nobody else had this. The I love the little pan across as everybody's opening their laptops and everybody has their own customized boot screens. Yeah, like Joey's got the little happy face, and then serial killer. I can't remember what his was, but I think it was serial related. Like it was Count Chocula or something. And then of course, Acid Burn has her acid uh, her fire logo, which was yeah. the coolest looking one. And then uh, Crash Override has just a bunch of warning labels, which is kind of silly. I, I loved the line, though. Use your best viruses to buy us some time. <laughs> like All these guys just have custom viruses, I guess, that they're going to throw into this machine. Did, do you not? <laughs> I mean, you had your own custom viruses, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could use the run-of-the-mill ones, like the, the ones I got at Walmart, but I like to tweak mine a little bit. Yeah, no, you, know, you got to use your best viruses. Oh, I only have some average viruses, sorry. Now is the, 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 the big climax of the, the hacking of the Gibson, and you've got these guys throwing their best viruses, Cookie Monster. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Where, whereas now, Penn, so they flash back and forth between them doing, uh, doing the hacks and planning the viruses and flash back to the Gibson mainframe with Penn Gillette asking the plague what he, what he should do. Run antivirus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, run into virus. And when Lorraine Bracco is standing behind them, like trying to understand any of the terminology. It's like any any executive in an outage situation, you yeah. know, to the network guys, fix it. Pendulette's trying to explain to her what's going on, which annoys the plague because he's stopping what he's doing to explain to her. So he's like, God damn it, get back to your job, kind of thing. <laughs> to which this is about the time where we we do find that uh between Gillette and the plague, they're able to kill off the oncoming attack faster than they can launch them. Uh, I do also like the mont- the kind of montage at the beginning of it where you have the spinning phone booths as they like, yeah, right. And you have them all in separate spinning phone booths. Yeah, that was a nice shot. It was much better than the distracting visualizations of the hacking, you know, the 3D. Yeah. Or and yeah. then all the all the equation letters and everything flying over their face as, as it's projected on their face, kind of. I know that it's much more entertaining than just watching people type code. It, it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> Enhance. Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. Yeah, they're trying to find the same garbage file for one, uh, and then everyone else is trying to run interference. And as they keep get kicked out of the system one by one, it finally ends up kicking uh dave locates the file and then gets kicked immediately so they finally have to go up to joey kate receives the call from razor and blade saying are you are you guys ready let's go kind of thing and that's when they organize all the all the worldwide hackers to basically come in and ddos them hack the planet code word to basically give the plague something else he has to fight so he can't pay attention to Joey finally finding that file. I found it humorous that they're depicting the uh, hacking the Gibson literally on his screen as that full 3D VR. And then when Dave gets kicked out and he has to r- come up to Joey and he's like, OK, I found the garbage file. And then he starts reading off the path name to it. I'm like, oh, really? Why aren't you telling him to go left and then right and then left? Because it's a VR. <laughs> so that's. That's where the continuity broke me. That's where it lost me. <laughs> that, no, that's where it lost you. <laughs> <laughs> and, then we, and as he's still downloading the file, uh, the, you know, you flash back to Fisher Stevens, who is just going nuts because his system's getting completely overloaded. But he's kind of lost his, lost his mind at this point. Well, they, they do finally uh, – well, the, the Secret Service gets to Grand Central Station, and it shows them oh, closing yes, in I on the – 
cl- closing in on the phone booths and then they finally get to them and then they find out that the phone booths are all uh, jacked into each other and it was all they're on they're on a different floor they're yeah they've got the phone booth handsets duct taped together which yeah. i for one they've got them duct taped together the wrong way they're basically going <laughs> ear set i'm telling you they're going earpiece to earpiece and mic to mic so that wouldn't work no that wouldn't i know understand yeah yeah i, I get what they're going for but like that they needed to flip one of them over so i get what they were going for i also am not sure and this this might be worth a mythbusters but I'm not sure if taping the phone sets together like that would give you enough signal fidelity to be able to do what they were doing. I doubt it. I mean, it's 28.8. But again, it, it's a nice con. It's actually a cool concept of how to reroute phones through a public pay system. It, it gives them just enough time to to finally get that full file, and uh, then they all get arrested. But serial killer was not in the group. He was he was outside. Yeah, I can't remember what they sent him out to do. Oh, I just I just figured that was part of the plan, like keep one outside. So as they're walking by a trash can, Dade does this nice little lift of the of the disc from his back pocket and two fingers it into the trash can. So serial killer is able to, to to dig through the trash and find the find the disc, and he's able to take it to to razor and burn a uh, razor and blade, and they. They decode it and learn, find out everything. Everyone's getting arrested and arraigned. They are able to broadcast and hack into all the air airwaves and and pretty much air all the dirty laundry of Mister the Plague, the root of the the worm, the root of the Da Vinci virus, and just pretty much lay it all out there. And the good guys win. Yeah, uh, but the funny the funniest part on, uh, out of that one, I think, is right as they get arrested. You you jump to uh, Lorraine and Fisher Stevens celebrating. You know we just got away with it. Yeah. We've got our twenty five million. They clink glasses of champagne and then just book it upstairs to <laughs> the next scene. As they're as serials broadcasting uh, all this information, he's literally framing Lorraine because it was her account that it was under. Yeah, she wake it. Sh- it shows her waking up from the bed, going, "What the hell." And he's gone. The plague is gone. And then, and then she's like, son of a bitch, Eugene. He, she turns to the side and he bolted. <laughs> yeah, Fisher Stevens is nowhere. Uh, next time we see him is in a complete like wig and makeup kit with a new accent. Uh, something he's obviously good at <laughs> uh, on, a, on a plane out of the country. But, uh, but not fast enough. And this enough. was weird because he was on a, in the air on a plane to Tokyo. Mm-hmm. So they waited until they're midair to arrest him. That's that's a 15-hour flight from New York. <laughs> they, they got a long wait is all I'm saying. The only thing I can think of is he, he was able to evade him so long, maybe they wanted to make sure he couldn't get off the plane. Maybe. Maybe it was, hopefully it was still over the U.S. and they could, they could land somewhere and let him off. Well, I don't know why he was going to Tokyo. You'd think he would have went to, uh, you know, some... Non-extradition? Yeah. But then you've got they crash and burn. Their challenge is now over. So yeah, they decided that that uh, Dade won for the sole purpose of they believed that was the only way he was ever going to get a date. So that was kind of <laughs> funny. So now you have Angelina Jolie in this techno Romulan dress. dress. Yeah. Hey, it worked for me. Yeah. And they and they go swimming. Uh, yeah, up on the um, on the top of a building. To which he has has her look over uh, at the side of the a side of three other buildings where he has hacked in and made all the lights in the uh, offices read "crash and burn" on the three skyscrapers. It's a good ending. My my thoughts on this is that there's a lot to love, but there is a lot to hate in this movie. And and like I said at the beginning, I, I didn't have the nostalgia uh, glasses going in, so it was all very odd to me. Uh, especially during my, you know, current career and and seeing all this stuff, it was certain parts were just absurd and distracting. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, is it a serious tale of kids caught up in a heist between a villain and the secret service, or is it a cartoon spoof of the hacker subculture and cybersecurity in general? You know, which movie is it? And yes, there's (laughs) (laughs) say uh, Miller and Jolie were in one movie and, Oscar winner Fisher Stevens was in another. 
I would say go watch Mr. Robot instead. If I had to recommend this or recommend a hacking thing mm-hmm. to someone, go watch Mr. Robot. If you want realism to what it's what it's truly like in this la- in that type of life, then I would say yes, Mr. Robot, Silicon, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, less of the criminality part of it and more on the actual right. IT-ish part of it. The mundane IT. Like I said, IT. <laughs> Have you tried turning it off and back on again? <laughs> <laughs> or the IT crowd, if you want the funny version of how re- of how really mundane that is. Um, but from a from just a story point, if you if you take all the campiness and all the you know Hollywood hackerism hackism that are you know in a lot of these movies or in TV shows, uh, it's I still think it's a very solid plot with pretty decent characters. Again, I'm kind of with you on, I liked Fisher Stevens, but his character, I liked his character, but his character did not fit in this movie. No, not at all. Whereas Johnny Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie, and I'm not the biggest Angelina Jolie fan. This is one of my favorite movies of her with her. Oh, I I actually have that as a note that she is oddly, you know, likable and cute and charming. You know, that's just not, I'm not a big Jolie fan either. This is her least Tomb Raider-ish type role. Yeah, she always, in her more recent movies, she comes across as, I don't know, snobby, elite sort of mannerisms. Mm-hmm. And, and granted, I don't know what she's like in her personal life, but that, that's the character she plays. And, and this one seems, you know, just likable. Once she opens up after the whole, you know, you're not getting into that computer stuff now, are you? From then on, she's very likable and very, uh, well, just charming. Good, good, uh, good chemistry with with Miller. So an interesting note that I found out uh, that after this movie came out, the uh, the phrase "hack the Gibson" turned into an Urban Dictionary type slang for married IT personnel that uh, meant masturbation. Really? Hey, I'm gonna go hack the I'm gonna go hack the Gibson. <laughs> so now I'm going to be using that. Not that I hack the Gibson or anything. <laughs> three three interesting bits of trivia I found. Uh, John Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie were married shortly after this movie. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, and then they got divorced four years later. Not bad for Hollywood marriage. The garbage file was uh, 666K. So 666. <laughs> Remember back when six, with 666K would have been a lot? That's almost half of that floppy disk. Yeah. Can you imagine filling up half of a hard drive with uh, nowadays with one file? And then this one... Considered for the role of the plague was Quentin Tarantino. I'd watch that. Yeah, that, that, that would have been a different movie altogether. <laughs> yeah, although he might have made it a little darker. That, and again, that wouldn't fit in this. Quentin, if you're listening, you need to make Hackers too. Absolutely. I know, I know uh, you sent me an article that the, uh, the, the original director is trying to, to get Hackers 2 made, which you're, you're never going to get. Same crew. I don't, I don't no, think you're going to. unfortunately. It would be nice to have one that was in basically the same crew 30 year, you know, 20, 30 years later where they're all grown up and have respectable jobs now and have to get pulled back into that life. You know, they're out of the life and they have to get pulled back into it because their kids or someone they know gets framed type thing for maybe a ransomware. Uh, we were talking in text message about this, but my pitch for that would be serial killer is now he's heading a Google or, or Alphabet or, or some sort of high-end big tech company, and he has completely sold out. And he's the villain now. And so Ooh. maybe he has a change of heart somewhere. But just, And then this is based on me seeing Matthew Lillard in Twin Peaks. He can do it. It would be, it would be fun to watch. He's, he's, now, he's no longer the hippie. He is the reformed hippie as, as, the, as that executive telling his friends to grow up and – get a real job and, and yeah, while he's doing lives. sinister stuff and, and maybe, maybe it's all twofold. Maybe he's got that persona, but he does have that secret identity that where he's actually still trying to stick it to the man in his alter ego online. You know, there's mm-hmm. plenty of different stories they could easily do a good story with all these characters 20 years later. Yeah. I just don't see uh, the actual actors coming back for it. Unfortunately. I think you could, you could get everyone, but Joe Lee, I bet. Yeah. That'd be good though. But if Quentin Tarantino was directing it, you could get Jolie. Oh. That, that would yeah. be the draw. There you go. So, Quentin Tarantino, if you're listening, note number two. <laughs> Make a darker version of Hackers, too. 
And, and that's my, I mean, of our usual questions uh, as far as what a different version I'd you'd like to see. I would have liked to see this done as a serious heist movie and take out the cartoony shit. But again, that, that has been done. Maybe not as much as that time, but the, the full on serious ones have been done. Uh, as much as I can say, I'd like to see one type of movie like this where all the IT workings were 100% authentic. I just know that how boring that would be to anybody that's not in it in IT and even boring to most of us that are. It's one of those things. It'll have to be done once just to just to show everybody this is why we make things Hollywoodish. As, as technology's so improved and storytelling has improved, you know, they they fit hacking elements into many things nowadays in in madam secretary the u.s government hacks moscow and you know causes a, a two-minute blackout just to show the russians that we can you know, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a you know it's and it's it's done in a dramatic intense scene you know things things like that and it's not it, they don't use like the jurassic park this is unix i know this sort of <laughs> this sort of visualizations it's my, all just in that is my it's, favorite it's in the scene situation <laughs> I love that. This is a Unix system. I know this. <laughs> Meanwhile, full on 3D model, <laughs> just like this. Would you like to see this movie from a told from a different perspective? Uh, I put Wendell Pierce for that. I would love yeah. to have seen you know only from his point of view, where he has no clue what these idiots are saying. He's being duped by one side, and these kids are running circles around him. You know, just more more of that. I would have. I would enjoy that. I was sort of on the on the lines. I picked Mark Anthony as the as the guy who's working yeah. for the the head of the FBI or Secret Service task unit, where Mark Anthony knows this guy has no idea what he's talking about, but he's getting all the press, he's getting all the notoriety, and everything. So it's Mark Anthony in the background trying to trying to actually, you know, be the one to save the day and he never gets the credit. Well, for see, it. I thought they were setting up Mark Anthony to be a hacker himself just in secret because when the, the other guy was reading the manifesto earlier in the movie, mm-hmm. he's like, that sounds cool. Exactly. Uh, you know, just, and then he, you know, dancing with the kids and just, I have a theory that that was uh, a storyline that got left on the cutting room. It may have been because they, they, it feels there's a couple pieces there. Yeah. I have a feeling that was something that was, uh, possibly uh, in the works and then just got left on the cutting room floor because you didn't really see Mark Anthony that much afterwards. I don't recall seeing him in the second half of the movie much, if at all. No, I don't, I don't recall either. Not even when they all got arrested. Maybe no, I only watched this there, the one but, time. So uh, yeah, I may have missed a few things. I mean, and I've only watched it the one time in the last 10, 15 years. So <laughs> it's been a while. So who would you uh, recommend f- from this movie for our new Hall of Fame. So from this one, um, my first thought was Fisher Stevens, but uh, like you said, from uh, as a as an actor, he's probably my favorite of this movie. As a character, he wasn't my favorite character in this movie. Honestly, Johnny Lee Miller, his portrayal in that, and especially considering I've seen him in so in several other things. I know he's in Train Spotting, and then uh, the Eli mm-hmm. Stone in Elementary. It, this was a, a hard one. I mean. I'm a big fan of of Matthew Lillard, as I've mentioned several times. I'm, I'm I'm leaning him, but I mean, you got Angelina Jolie, who has had a tremendous career, Oscars, and that's actually a really good point with the the fact that Angelina Jolie, yeah, uh, the fact with Angelina Jolie was able to play a non typical Angelina Jolie character. Again, I know this was earlier in her career, but I really liked her too. It it, it is hard. I think my vote has to be Angelina Jolie, though. Yeah, and I can I can go with you on that one. Now is the time on our show where we rank the movie based on our fan review while also adding in the IMDb rating. This is a 10-point scale, and the average will put the movie in our mega list. So, Aaron, what is your rating for Hackers? So, uh, like as you've mentioned a couple times, I am burdened with the nostalgia factor on this movie. Uh, I obviously recognize that there uh, a lot of it is very Hollywoodish and campy, uh, and yet I still enjoy a lot of the old school references and even a lot of the jokes about it. Um, so I enjoy I enjoyed this movie. I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, you you got to take this one with a grain of salt. This is not what the real lifestyle is or even was back in the '90s. 
uh, even though, uh, you know, I got into this type of thing, not so much the illegal portion, uh, section of what they were doing, but I got into that, this type of stuff back when I was in middle school in the late eighties, uh, to early nineties. And, uh, I can tell you for a fact, I never went into any, tr- to any trance parties. So I'm kind of pissed <laughs> off about that. Um, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. So, I mean, I would give this a 6.7. I enjoyed the movie. Uh, it definitely was not a great movie for me. Uh, like I said earlier, I don't have the nostalgia to, to, to bump it up a little bit. It was just too, too campy in places. It, it was all over the place. Uh, I did enjoy a lot of the computer elements that they got right. Had I seen this when I was 15, when it came out, it probably would have uh, you know, changed my life a little bit, but I was already kind of on the IT track anyway, even kind of changed a report card once. Uh-huh. <laughs> not in the system we just got our hands on the uh the same paper that the uh office used so so i was able to print my own report card ah uh, so not so much hacking but forgery you could call it that <laughs> but yeah i changed my grade from a, a very low grade to a c you know you don't go to a you just go to no go to you never so, go so, full uh, a no so i was able to just not get in trouble from my parents so Sorry, Dad, if yeah. you're listening. That's right up there with changing our birth dates on our uh, drivers or on our forgery driver's licenses, which oh. we didn't do, Mom and Dad. <laughs> so my rank for this movie is a six. They could have done a could have done a lot of things different and bumped that up with a good heist movie, but they just they just didn't. All right. So we have a every so time we say is, heist movie, I just think of Rick and Morty. I hate <laughs> heist movies. <laughs> 20 minutes in and out, Morty. That's it. <laughs> quick, uh, quick adventure. Um, IMDb has this at a 6.2. So we're right in there. We're right yeah. in there. So by our powers combined, 6.3. Hey, there we go. We raised it. We raised it a point. We raised it a point. Um, <laughs> we raised it a tenth off IMDb. <laughs> yeah. Hack the planet. <laughs> So this one is definitely our lowest ranking of the five, but yeah, it was enjoyable I'm, nonetheless. I'm okay with that, but it was still, again, it was still enjoyable. If you're in the six range, it's still a decent movie. Once you get into the five and lower. Yeah. And just knowing what else is on this list, I know it's not going to end up being our least. Our no, lowest. no, not at all. <laughs> oh God. <no. laughs> this could still make the top 10. <laughs> So about this time, uh, we like to do a little media pitch kind of thing of what uh, other types of shows or other movies we've watched recently. Just to give a little shout out or recommendation on something else uh, that we uh, also watched recently. Uh, Steve, do you have anything that you've been watching recently that you'd uh, recommend to our viewers, viewers, uh, listeners? Uh, so lately, I had the opportunity to rewatch The Hateful Eight, Quentin Tarantino again. So ah, yes. uh, it, it, I just, I had a couple uh, hours to spare and um, I saw it there and I, I, it's a, it's a great movie. It's one of my favorite from Quentin Tarantino. I know it's gotten a bad rap from some for being too long or how it was shot on, on, you know, odd uh, 70 mi- meters like or whatever, that. but, but yeah, it's, I always it's like that one. it is slow starting, but once they get into the, the have you seen it? Yeah, it's it's okay. very Reservoir Dogs ish in how they shoot yeah. it, to yeah, where it's so, just so this, it's no this is, action, no real action most of the time. Yeah, this is uh, non spoiler for around, for anyone that hasn't seen it. Uh, I'll just say that you know you got a group of guys out in the middle of a snowy uh, tundra, Wild West style, and once they get into a, they get, they all get snowed into this cabin, and it's it's kind of the thing meets Reservoir Dogs meets uh, Twelve Angry Men. And you've got mm. nobody knows who's aligned with who. Nobody knows each other's agenda. People start dying, and nobody knows why. You can even throw Clue in there. It's also a little yeah, bit of people, Clue as far as yeah. Nobody it, trusts anybody. Obviously, it's set and you've in got the a powerhouse late eighteen hundreds or late eighteen hundreds at the yeah uh, it, just after the Civil War. You got a powerhouse of actors with uh, Kurt Russell, Samuel L. Jackson, um, uh, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. Michael Madsen is it's all this great cast of characters who are all just putting in great performances. And it, it, 
you know, as with most Quentin Tarantino movies, it's, you know, it escalates into craziness. Uh, but I mean, if you got, I mean, if you're mentioning to spare, Reservoir Dogs, <laughs> as you're saying Reservoir Dogs, uh, it also has Tim Roth and Michael Manson in it. That's true. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And the uh, lovely yeah. Zoe Bell. So if, if you've got three hours to spare, I recommend The Hateful Eight. Yeah. Oh, God, that is a, that is a long one. How about yourself? What are you watching these days? So um, I recently finished the new uh, Disney Plus series, The Mighty Ducks Game Changers. Uh, now, being a hockey person myself, this is the primary reason I ended up watching it. Uh, you know, when The Mighty Ducks came out, Mighty Ducks is a kid's movie. So obviously this new resurgence one is also primarily a kid's movie, but it is filled with a lot of really good nostalgia from the original, I'd say original first two movies, at least maybe not the third one. Um, But it definitely had some good, good cameos, good nostalgia. We got, we actually got to see uh, good old coach Gordon Bombay, AKA Emilio uh, back in action. Um, and I literally finished the last episode of that today. It's nice, you know, 10 episodes, about 30 minutes each. Uh, so anybody that liked the, a lot of good fan uh, service, original in Mighty Ducks movies. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Anybody that liked the original, uh, Mighty Ducks movies, I'd say give it a shot. They, they do start off in a completely different direction than I expected. And I liked how they did it. So it's not what how you many episodes originally is expect. Uh, 10. 10. 10 30 minute episodes uh streaming now on disney plus oh they're only only half hour okay yeah i will have to give that a, a shot all right now it's time to spin break a deal spin the wheel here we go spin that wheel. 306 <laughs> Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> He's got the laugh. Oh, yes. <laughs> he can't even say it. We oh, are the three you see him. Amigos. Amigos, yes. And, and amigos, amigos forever will be. be. <laughs> so the next episode is going to be a musical. <laughs> <laughs> you were waiting for that. So you were oh, this is this beautiful. One. This is beautiful. <laughs> I need I need to start like recording the uh the spin so people don't think we cheat on this but no the 1986 classic Three Amigos. Tres Amigos. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you for listening and we hope you stay with us through this little experiment. What did you think of Hackers? Let us know in our socials and we'll be sure to tell you how wrong you are. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Check out our website in the show notes to see the full list of movies we'll be covering and our rankings thus far. You can also visit us on our Patreon where we'll try to post some random outtakes before the final cut. We'll see you next time on on Cinema Cinema Decon. Decon. Planet. Planet.